Yeah, so welcome. This is the first lecture for the course Introduction to Cryptology. And so this is really setting the basis of why we need cryptology. Well, let me start with cryptography, which is the constructive side of cryptography and cryptology. So the motivation for doing cryptography is that we have communication channels which are spying on our data and also which are trying to modify our data. Now, depending on what communication channel you have available, if you can whisper into the ear of somebody, you might be not so worried about it. Okay, you might be worried about listening devices, but you get a little bit closer and you know you're talking to the right person. But the normal situation is that our people, well, let's call them as typical in cryptography, um, Alice as a sender and Bob as a receiver, that Alice and Bob are communicating via an untrusted network. So they have to send information from Alice to Bob and probably also from Bob to Alice in a way that something in the middle, well, you see um, Eve there with a the big earpiece. So Eve is the eavesdropper. So Eve can listen to all the communication. And so I've been highlighting two attackers here to highlight or to show like what level of attacker you should assume. So one is the National Security Agency, the NSA of the well, US, and the other one is Vladimir Putin, who is also well alleged to be quite curious about what's happening in the world. And so you can be sure that everything that Alice sends to Bob will go past Eve. So Eve has an interest in learning what Alice is sending to Bob. Eve might also have an interest in modifying the data that Alice sends to Bob, either to sow discord or just to mess up their meetings and so on. So the literal meaning of cryptography, so crypto is secret and graphing is writing, so cryptography actually means secret writing. So it is the art and science of how you modify messages, so transform messages, so that they keep things secret. Now modern cryptography has various security goals, so let's go first into where we want to use cryptography. So you are using cryptography in your daily life, whether you're going shopping and paying with your credit card, or you're doing online banking, getting this fancy, uh, you're scanning your barcode and then you're getting an access code for it. Um, you have a passport and you're past the border, or you have an ID card with a chip. All of those are using cryptography and you don't have to do anything extra. You don't actually need to know that you're using cryptography for it to work. Everything where you do internet commerce, they automatically modify your web page when you're typing HTTP or you're actually just typing ing.nl or rabbank.nl and they automatically modify to HTTPS where the S in there stands for secure. Yep, don't comment on how these things can be insecure, but at the core of it, the part which is really broken, but it's important that you understand it, that's where cryptography is sitting. Also, when you're using Facebook or WhatsApp, iMessage, those use encrypted messaging. So then you're having some form of security, some form of secrecy of message. So when Alice is talking to Bob or you're talking to your friend, then our very powerful Eve in the middle doesn't have a chance to figure out what you're sending. Now, these are examples of where you don't have to take effort, extra effort. Um, what we're expecting from you in this course is, for instance, that you're sending your homeworks to us by using PGP as an encryption. Now that is actually going some extra step and typically it goes wrong for the first round of homeworks. So I'm putting this in the second category of things where you're painfully aware that you're using cryptography or hopefully you're happily aware. So Signal is normally seen as a, as a success story. So Signal um, is another messaging app which runs on your phone. It's highlighting that it's doing everything encrypted. You know that you downloaded it because somebody in your circle of friends is a little bit more security conscious and so you're using that or using Tor browser um, so that you don't have other parties seeing which websites you're visiting. You're probably encrypting your computer disk or you're encrypting your iPhone that's now actually by default. With Windows it's also getting more default that you actually don't need to worry about it but you still will notice whether you're entering password to unlock it or you're going one step further and you're using a secure operating system. So Tails is again more on the privacy side, similar to Tor. So it is the operating system which is fully ephemeral, so it doesn't have any, well, 
you can have it with uh, stored data, but per se, you have um, that everything you do in a session disappears the moment you pull a USB stick, or using Cubes OS, which is uh, an operating system which has a good separation of things. Right? So that if you have a bug in your browser, it doesn't affect things you're doing in your lecture VM. Now, if you need some extra portion of, of motivation, so here's a quote from Edward Snowden uh, when he gave an Ask Me Anything on Reddit, basically saying like, what do you tell to a person that I don't care, I have nothing to hide? And this is the thing I very commonly heard here and maybe even here a little bit more commonly in the Netherlands and other countries. And so I liked what he was saying. Um, it's, Help them understand that they're misunderstanding the fundamental nature of human rights. No one needs to justify why they need a right. So you don't have to justify it. You don't have to go like, yes, I have something to hide. Because people are afraid to say I have something to hide because, oh, that makes them suspicious. What he's saying is the burden of justification falls on the one seeking to infringe upon the right. But even if they did, you can't give away the right of others because they're not useful to you. So even if you or your friend decides that you don't need privacy, you don't have the power to decide that nobody else needs privacy. There are people who need privacy. Just assume that other people need this, even if it doesn't mean so much to you. And now since you made it to this course, so welcome to the world of more paranoia. Um, one of my targets is to convince you that you should care more about privacy and security and the other target is, or the other goal is, to actually help you join the group of people to build more privacy, more security. Now, my tools are the tools of a cryptographer, and so I can teach you what we do in cryptography to build things that are more secure. And that also means understanding how things get broken. So it's not just purely constructive, we also have to understand what Eve can do. So don't get me wrong, we will see cryptanalysis as well as cryptography, um, but we will understand the basic building blocks of security in this course. So let's go back to our characters, Alice and Bob. So let's go for the easiest situation that Alice and Bob have met, they're whispered in each other's ear, and afterwards they have some form of shared information. So here's the first bit of jargon. We call this shared bit of information a key. And a key is, well, here it's symbolized as a physical object, like a normal lock in a key. But it's actually, you can think of it as a computer program or some input to a computer program. So there is a mechanism to encrypt, and well, as the title of the slide says, encrypt and authenticate, so which turns our plain text into something which is scrambled. So Alice uses this key to turn her readable letter into something which is scrambled. And let's forget about Eve for the moment. When Bob's received the scrambled message, he uses the same key to unscramble it and gets the nice message back. So the key is just a modification of the message. And we don't want to have that this is baked into the algorithm. We want to have an algorithm which is public that everybody can study and that the only secret that Eve does not know is this key. So Eve can know everything they are doing to scramble the messages except for some little bit of information which only the two of them share. Of course Eve must not know this key um, and then what happens is Alice and Bob exchange any number of messages. So some go from Alice to Bob and then at some point Bob sends something back. So the encryption mechanism to get some notation fixed. So encryption is this method of taking something readable and turning it into something scrambled. So it takes what we call a plain text, that is a readable text, and produces a cipher text, so the scrambled version of the text. And then on Bob's end, we see the opposite operation, which is called decryption, which takes a cipher text and produces a message. And yes, you want the system to be functional, so when you're taking a ciphertext, which is the encryption of a message, and you're plugging this into the decryption function, then you should get the original message back. Now, security goal number one is confidentiality. So Eve should not learn what Alice is sending to Bob. But we also want to ensure that Eve cannot do sabotage on the message. So Eve could be interested in flipping some bits, change the information that Alice sends to Bob, 
so that Bob gets the wrong information about when they're meeting. Or if Alice sends a yes or no, if well, if Eve manages to flip this, then Bob would say we're voting against, while well, Alice wanted to say let's vote in favor of. And Eve could also try to impersonate Alice. So Eve could say, hi Bob, wanna meet today? And then Bob shows up with uh, expectation to meet Alice, and then is Eve there, which well, Bob didn't want to know. So what we want the character to achieve is that when Eve is modifying the message, so he is symbolized with this tainted red square, so we're now having our cybertext getting modified by Eve. Eve doesn't know, I mean, let's assume that confidentiality is holding, Eve doesn't know what the message is, but she can still scramble it. Then Bob should not accept the ciphertext or should not decrypt it and get a message. So Bob should say, ha, huh, this is something wrong. And something wrong could mean it's not from Alice or it is not what Alice has sent. So we need some form of definition what invalid means, but the outcome of a decryption can actually be failure. We can't stop sabotage. If Eve wants to do a denial of service attack, Eve can stop the communication, crypto can't help you. Eve can modify each message so that Bob only gets garbage. Crypto can't help you with that either. But crypto can help you so that Bob does not accept a message as coming from Alice if it actually came from Eve. So here again, the goals of cryptography with a bit more words. So confidentiality is the secrecy of the contents of the message. So Eve cannot learn anything about the contents of the message. And anything is, well, a big word. So often Eve can learn the length of the message. So then you have to hide inside what actually the length of the message was. Maybe if yes or no, if you're sending letter by letter, you would actually give away the information whether it's two letter word or three letter word. So, well, Eve will learn that everything is padded, everything is extended to 10 characters, and so Alice can send most words in that. So the main operation to achieve confidentiality is encryption, and then inside encryption we have such things as padding, and, well, that's another place where things often go wrong. Then the other two goals concern the, the square turning red and then Bob not accepting those. So there's integrity, so Bob cannot, uh, Eve can't modify the message. And again, Eve can modify the message and therefore stop from Bob, Bob from getting it, but Bob will not fool, be fooled for it. So if Bob accepts the message, it has not been modified. And then similarly, authenticity means that Eve cannot impersonate Alice to Bob. Well, okay, he, Eve can try, Eve can send a letter, hey Bob, here's Alice, but Bob would notice. So if Bob accepts the message as coming from Alice, that message really came from Alice. So those three goals, um, coincidentally, the initials read CIA, so well, keep this as a small moniker, it's not that we think the CIA is particularly good, but still, the goals of cryptography are confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. The cryptographic tools that we're going to see in this, in this course um, are highlighted in blue. So we're going to see methods to protect against data being modified. So that is the most integrity protection and authenticity protection. And there we're going to see two different types. One is called public key signatures and one is called message authentication codes, and of course we're also going to see methods to encrypt. So these are the very basic building blocks, and actually encryption is also split into two different kinds of encryption depending on what Alice and Bob know as a prerequisite, like do they have a shared key already or not, do they still have to get this key. And then there are other factors such as, well, can you store data securely, does the attacker have access to a USB stick, which is where you keep your keys, well, then we're violating the requirement number one, namely that Eve doesn't know the secret. Um, is there security, like in the physical world, you have access control to devices. And then on top of these building blocks that we're going to study here, we're doing bigger buildings. We're doing things where 
while we try to protect it against the Nalo service attack, at least making it harder for Eve to stop this. Don't confuse this with integrity and authenticity. Those are stopping Bob from being fooled. This is a step where we're trying to make it better to, well, make it harder for the attacker to do Nalo service attack or stopping traffic analysis. There's a high level protocols that you might see in your master's uh, study where it goes into how electronic voting can work with cryptography. I'm not endorsing it, but at least uh, it's interesting to see what possibilities we're having or for instance where we could be searching on encrypted data or computing on encrypted data. What we're going to do in this course in the introduction is on the top level, so we're going to learn how the building blocks work and what to watch out for the security of those. I don't mention script analysis. So cryptology has two components, it's cryptography and crypt analysis. Now crypt analysis is a study of security, or you can also think of this as attacks. When you come home and tell your parents that you're doing a course in cryptography and that you're learning about attacks, they might be a little bit worried. Or when you're talking to a, the reporter of a newspaper, don't you say the word that you're doing attacks. What you're doing is you analyze the security. But actually, honestly, um, cryptanalysis is ultimately constructive, at least the kind of cryptanalysis that we're doing. We're doing this in order to figure out how to make the system more secure. You need to understand how weak it is and then either stop using it or, if it's possible, scale up the parameters so that nobody, even the NSA and even the Russians, can attack the system. So cryptanalysis, the way that we do it, where we publish about it, where we tell the world about it, where we teach teaching courses about it, um, is to ensure that the secure systems get used and that the insecure ones get discarded. I should also highlight what it means to break a system. Because, well, there is the break of a system which makes the headlines of the New York Times, which is basically you found something on the internet which is being used by millions of people and you show that you can write a simple Python script and you have all their secrets. Luckily, those things essentially never happen. So what we normally see as a break is if you somewhat weaken the system. And breaking a system can mean that the hardness assumption that you base things on was not as hard as people thought. It can also mean it wasn't hard at all. They just missed something. So it can be that you take an attack which used to take exponential time and turn into a polynomial time attack, so it is not hard at all, or you turn it from 2 to the 128 to 2 to the 120. Well, that is 2 to the 8 times faster, 256 times faster, that is big a result, but it's not what we would normally assume to see on the New York Times. And also, um, when you break a system, you might find the secret key, or you might find another algorithm which takes some effort, but less effort than recovering the key, in order to get the message. Or maybe just some information about the message. Remember, confidentiality is supposed to mean that the Eve cannot get any information about the message. So if you can find out something about, say, the first character or just the first bit of the message, that would already be a weakness of the system. You can write a paper about it. But it is not a break where you have to run away screaming and go like, oh my god, the, the world is nigh. Similarly, I mean, this was just talking about the confidentiality aspects. If you're thinking about the integrity and authenticity aspects, then also a break can mean that you've managed to fool Bob into accepting a modified message or a non-authentic message. Or it could also just be that you're taking a lot of messages and then can craft something. So there are also lots of factors at play in how many ciphertext, plaintext, how many authenticated messages have you seen before you can do this. And what we're seeing in practice now is that weak crypto, so in the 90s, um, well, most famous in the US, had the crypto wars. So that was a time when the US government was saying that people cannot export cryptography. So the initial browsers, so Netscape, 
had two different versions, one for Americans in America and one for the rest of us. And every browser, well, they built one browser, so every browser that anybody got would support those versions and then one would be switched on or the other. Well, unfortunate truth is that as soon as you have a weak system next to a strong one, the attacker often or most of the time can figure out how to downgrade you to the weak one. By, for instance, claiming that your IP address, like your location, is outside US and so you couldn't use the strong crypto. And amazingly enough, at least like if two years ago, 2018, we saw an attack which was using crypto which everybody thought was retired, but our modern, modern days browsers like Mozilla Firefox was still supporting the very old cryptography from the 90s, which was there as a backup of the backup of the backup, but smart researchers figured out a way how to fool the computer into thinking, oh, this is the only thing we can speak, and so suddenly they could break the system because of the weak crypto from the 90s. So it's always a bad idea to allow bad crypto to get in, because it will stick around. Um, we're going to see a whole bunch of different ways to break systems. So these are, of course, specific to the systems we're seeing on the previous slide I was mentioning. Authentication systems, I mentioned signature system, I mentioned encryption system. Of course, each of those has their own arsenal of approaches. And then there are also some automatic tools. Um, this is an active area of research. So if you like doing this, there is certainly space for more. And of course, when you do analysis, um, this is basically what I can do in my research. So this is a, I mean, for an academic, this is a happy cluster. It has a whole bunch of CPUs and GPUs and good amount of RAM. But our real attacker is this. Just look for scale at the little things next to the buildings. So these are trucks and cars and see how tiny these are. So these are, well, many, many soccer fields the size and that is, um, well, it's apparently just a storage facility, but it also has its own power substation of 60 megawatt. Um, it's a station from the NSA in Utah where they're storing data and probably doing some operations on the data as well. So that's what our attacker has. That's the computer power. It's not just the academic cluster. It's, well, their own power substation and basically unlimited storage. To summarize what we've done in this lecture, so we've been looking at cryptology and the two parts that we, well, that cryptology consists of and also the two parts that we're going to see in this course are cryptography and crypt analysis. So cryptography is the design of crypto systems, so it's the constructive aspect, whereas crypt analysis is looking into attacks the analysis of crypto systems, so design and analysis. And also the design part includes, of course, the implementation of crypto system, and I mentioned these larger building blocks, so that's also part of cryptography, so that's building on top of the basic pieces and giving proofs about the relation between those, so that is all the cryptography corner. And then crypto analysis, that is where you analyze the system, and you also analyze the implementation. For instance, you could look into, can I learn any information about the key or the message by getting information about how long it took to encrypt. So that is part of analysis. And we're gonna look into both of these aspects. And well, the next lecture is about historical ciphers, which have a lot of analysis and not so much cryptography. So that's it for today. Thank you for your attention.